All right, friends, thanks for joining us for another virtual mind walk. So if you're new to this program, the mind walk program is underwritten by the Thomas E. and Mary Catherine Eltsroth Fund and supported by the Central Coast State Parks Association. If you would like to help support the virtual mind walk program or any other state parks educational program, check out the link you see on the screen. Um, it's the one in blue, centralcoastparks.org slash friend, where you can make a donation to the Central Coast State Parks Association. If you donate $35 or more to become a friend of CSPA and receive perks such as store discounts and newsletter subscrip subscriptions. There are several different programs that you can choose to support and make a direct impact on your Central Coast Parks. Thank you so much. Today we have with us Amanda Barth, and she is a rare insect conservation program coordinator for Utah State University. Her presentation today is titled Understanding and Implementing Strategies in the Western Monarch Conservation Plan. Amanda is the rare insect conservation coordinator for Utah State University and leads Utah's rare insect conservation program that works in close partnership with the Division of Wildlife Resources. She has a background in pollination ecology, public education, and community conservation outreach, and earned a master's in ecology from University of California, Irvine. She is currently serving her third year as chair for the Western Monarch and Native Pollinator Working Group with the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, which coordinates pollinator conservation efforts with Western states and federal partners. So as usual, we will formally be addressing all the questions that come in at the end. And so you don't forget your question, feel free to type it into the Q&A or utilize the chat function on Zoom. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Amanda. Thank you so much, Mallory. I'm gonna just pull up my share screen option here. Okay, let's see, that's screen two. Can you see my my slide like is the presentation mode on there okay perfect yep, it looks great great okay so i'm just gonna get my setup here um thanks mallory and thank you very much for uh to to the central coast uh state parks association for in, inviting me to this opportunity to be able to share with you all i'm really pleased to offer some um, insight into this sort of complex and, 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 and deep document. So like Mallory said, my name is Amanda. I wear a few different hats pertaining to pollinator conservation and primarily I, I focus at the state level um, on rare insect conservation for Utah. Um, but I am here today on behalf of the Western Monarch and Native Pollinator Working Group, which is part of WAFA, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And uh, one of the first objectives for this working group when it was formed in 2017 was to develop this conservation plan for Western monarch butterflies for the, for the, for the Western population that addressed um, the unique challenges and conservation needs that monarchs face in the arid West. And also that it provided a roadmap for partners and stakeholders at various levels to take meaningful actions that uh, help restore the monarch Western monarch habitat and population numbers. So for today's talk, I'm going to get into some of the general content details of the plan and really focus on some of the strategies outlined in the plan where actions taken by community members and nonprofit groups help to meet these conservation objectives. So again, my goals for today are to offer a basic overview of the Western Monarch Conservation Plan, including why it was developed, the geographical scope for the plan, and what's covered in each section of the plan. Specifically, section six of the plan covers the conservation strategies and breaks the guidance up by uh, areas of focus for land management. And while a great deal of this plan is aimed at agency level uh, implementation, there are many conservation outlines, actions outlined uh, for community, California community members and nonprofit groups. And so I wanna spend some time discussing those and offering some examples. And finally, the best way to keep track of all these great efforts is to report them through WAFWA's tracking tool. So I wanna show you how that works so you can share your conservation successes with WAFWA. 
So as some background, WAFO established the Western Monarch Working Group. It was originally called the Western Monarch Working Group in 2017 to develop a west-wide, multi-state, cooperative approach towards improving habitats that support the monarch butterfly during its overwintering, breeding, and migratory life stages. The group's seven member states include Arizona, California, Idaho, Nevada, Oregon, and Utah, which comprise the core of the Western Monarch Range. This 50-year plan was approved by WAFWA and state wildlife directors in early 2019 and provides a collaborative framework for action and accountability among state, federal, nonprofit, academic, private, and local partners to advance short and, term, short and long-term objectives for Western monarch recovery and success into the foreseeable future. This is an all hands on deck call to action because implementing these strategies will require engagement from the public sector, as well as community-based efforts to reach these recovery goals. So again, on the background, it's a pretty lengthy document. North American monarch numbers have declined, as you know, significantly since 1997 monarch efforts began. Both uh, the East and West populations have seen the same trajectory despite increased monitoring at multiple overwintering sites. In 2020, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced that monarch butterflies were warranted for protections under the Endangered Species Act, but were precluded at this time due to limited resources and higher priority species facing more extreme risks of extinction. So they're designated now as a candidate for listing, which means that states are still encouraged to focus on monarch conservation pending uh, the reevaluation in 2024 by the Fish and Wildlife Service. So sensing, censusing at Overwintering sites provides a consistent way to track population size during the most vulnerable point in the monarch's annual cycle. Um, and counts from groves along the Pacific coast, as you see here, these, this is a graph of those, of those counts, um, inform land managers and agencies along the relative, uh, about the relative impacts from threats and conservation measures uh, along, uh, across the Western monarch range. So I wanted to point out that we have Oh, I don't know if you can actually see it. Did I? I don't write it in there. I did. There it is. So that is kind of our goal uh, for um, a five-year average of uh, of overwintering counts that would be our short-term interim goal of being sort of out of the weeds of a of quasi-extinction risk. So that's five hundred thousand. Uh, among a certain number of groves, and I'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but I just wanted to point out on this graph where that goal is. So section one of the plan, and I'm just going to go through these, these sections kind of really uh, lightly. I, I'm giving you a high level until we get to section six. Section one of the plan presents the need for co the cooperative conservation strategy that is specific to the unique range for Western monarchs because there is so much arid desert out there and then all these riparian lands that sort of uh, snake through it. So um, it is a unique range and it describes the need, purpose and planning approaches for developing this plan. Um, another thing to point out is that some but not all of, Western, of the Western state wildlife agencies have formal authority to manage native insects. That presents a really significant challenge to direct action and also designating any kind of resources at the state level to do work with monarchs. So those states that don't manage insects do have authorities and resources to manage wildlife habitat for other species. So that can provide surrogate benefits to monarchs when used creatively. Section one also includes a formal purpose statement for the plan, which is to promote conservation strategies that encompass the entire life cycle of Western monarchs from their overwintering grounds along the California coast to their breeding and migratory habitats across the Western US. Section two describes the life history of Western monarchs, the distribution of monarchs across North America, the characteristics of suitable habitat for overwintering, breeding and migration, and the current population trends for monarchs at the time. So remember that this was authored um, through 2018 and several years of population trend data are not captured. 
The plan also includes a population viability analysis that suggests that Western monarchs are facing a regional extinction risk that we call a quasi-extinction um, in the coming decade, which is driven probably by land use change in the West. Section three of the plan discusses potential threats that have led to the declining status of Western monarchs. Identifying these specific threats to Western monarchs and locating them and, and aiming to mitigate them is an essential step to understanding and conserving this iconic and imperiled species. Many efforts highlighted in the plan are made possible entirely through partnerships between federal, state, nonprofit, academic, private partners, and volunteers. The Fish and Wildlife Service has led large scale collaborative efforts that provide regulatory flexibility and predictability to landowners who are willing to implement voluntary conservation actions to their land. Furthermore, actions taken at the state level in each of the seven states have promoted both monarch and pollinator habitat conservation across all eco regions of the Western Monarch Range. So this section highlights some of those successful programs to date at through 2018 that have accomplished um, that, that have been accomplished through collaboration and engagement of stakeholders and the public, uh, including efforts to fill crucial data gaps in habitat distribution, tagging of migratory adults and promoting awareness. So the long-term goal in this 50-year plan is to ensure a self-sustaining self population of monarch butterflies in the Western US and potentially mitigate the need for a federal listing. However, measurable short-term goals for population and habitat are necessary to indicate a reverse decline and a trajectory of continued growth. So section five of this plan outlines population and habitat targets for overwintering counts and managed overwintering sites. And these are really important for the framework of the conservation strategies that are outlined in section six of the plan. So I wanna go through each of these with you. In the short term, which is by 2019, um, which would mean a decade from the uh, approval of the plan, population overwintering counts from at least the 75 main roosting sites will have a five-year average of 500,000 butterflies, like I indicated on the, the overwintering count graph. The current five-year average, including the, these last two years, well, including the year before this last one, and including the last five years, is only about 98,000. So we have a lot of room for improvement on population count numbers. For overwintering habitat by 2029, at least half of all known active roosting sites will have designated protection and site management plans to protect monarch presence. There has been some progress in, in this uh, particular goal uh, already. So this is this is a good uh, there's there's good signs that this is that we are on the way to success with um, protecting some of these sites. And also the breeding and migratory habitat target for 2020, 2029 is currently focused on critical early season breeding habitat in the Central Valley of California um, and the adjacent foothills because of how essential that landscape is to the success of springtime generation of Western monarchs. And we've made it to section six, which provides detailed guidelines for conservation actions for all interested parties. The overwintering stage is regarded as the most vulnerable stage of the monarch's life cycle given the majority of the population aggregates in a really narrow area of suitable habitat and unfortunately shrinking habitat and is subjected to a variety of stressors, including urban development, coastal weather, pest and disease and other incompatible management practices. Most of the winter strategy or the overwintering strategies are guidelines for agency level land managers, but I'd like to point out one strategy that emphasizes community engagement. Overwintering grove management can't only rely on the public sector. So since, since so many of these groves occur on private property, this means important opportunities in outreach and information gathering or information sharing regarding grove management that supports uh, overwintering monarchs. So the action, one action that's outlined in this strategy is to educate owners and, and neighbors of top 50 priority states, sites, top 50 priority sites, as well as other important overwintering sites on the conservation importance of growth management. 
and a perfect recent example of this and how, how um, wonderfully fortuitous that this is my host today um, is the first installment of CCSPA's Western Monarch Trail at the Pismo State Beach Monarch Grove site. Um, they installed this beautiful interpretive sign on site that summarizes really important information about overwintering monarchs and public involvement. And there are some specific details that I wanted to include there because this is an ongoing effort. The natural lands strategies are also largely aimed at public entities that own and administer millions of acres of natural land throughout the western portion of the Monarch Range. Protection and restoration of these lands is vital to supporting breeding, migration, and overwintering. One strategy in particular offers opportunities for community involvement that focuses on incorporating locally adapted native plants and seeds for habitat enhancement and restoration work. So I'm gonna share two of these actions with examples. An important way to promote the use and availability of local native plants is to develop reference materials for their successful use in habitat restoration with careful attention to avoiding pesticide exposure to plant materials and landscapes. For example, the Tree of Life Nursery in Orange County offers a regular workshop on providing native milkweed and nectar resources to support monarchs and other native butterflies, as well as curating bundles of native plants for landscape installation. Identifying where these native plants are available is also vital to successful habitat enhancement. The nature, uh, another example of, uh, a perfect example of this action is uh, the California Native Plant Society uh, CalScape database that provides updated listings and information for native plant nurseries statewide. It's a really helpful resource. So it may go without saying, but the strategies and actions proposed for urban and industrial development really offer the most opportunities for community engagement. Really all three of these strategies describe actions that nonprofit and private community members can take. So I'm gonna go over those actions with examples for each. So incorporating, uh, did, it, did it highlight? I don't know if it worked. Incorporating conservation actions at the planning stage of project development is really valuable. Um, three of the actions in this strategy are highlighted here. Encouraging municipalities to take on the ground action can look like the city of Delray Oaks Mayor, Allison Kerr, taking the Mayor's Monarch Pledge just this past March. Um, officially recognizing pollinator-friendly landscapes can be as straightforward as establishing a monarch way station and then getting it registered like the one in Windsor, California. And the public can engage uh, work by landscaping companies and plant growers to plant locally sourced native milkweed species and nectar plants. Targeted outreach to um, uh, city leadership, local agencies and businesses and homeowners associations in historic breeding ranges can help inform simple ways to incorporate more pollinator habitat into their activities. Um, engagement with local planning and zoning commissions, city and county councils, mosquito abatement districts, and other local districts that manage water on the landscape can directly influence the inclusion of best management practices that support monarchs and other pollinators. Local development contractors and professional associations are also a potential audience for increased awareness of monarch and pollinator issues. And finally, the use of pesticides on urban and industrial properties is a big opportunity for engagement and increasing awareness on best management practices and also alternatives to, to, to standard pesticide applications. Uh, so encouraging big box retailers to purchase and distribute native milkweed and, ne and nectar plant species from vendors that don't treat their stock with pesticides is another really important action where California is taking great strides. For example, following California's Department of Agriculture, California's Department of Agriculture's destination, designation of tropical milkweed as a noxious weed recently, the County of Ventura instituted a ban on commercial sales of this species effective earlier this month. 
Rights of way strategies are generally aimed at land management entities, uh, uh, land management by entities like the Department of Transportation and other and utilities providers. So this is a section I'm just going to skip and go ahead and move on. For the agricultural sector, um, a number of these strategies harness opportunities like incentive programs that help working lands install diverse and pollinator friendly habitat where it's appropriate. For example, two of these strategies really include actions that can apply to landowner engagement. Because these actions are generally taken by private citizens, I won't list any specific examples. But I do want to illustrate how many of these actions encourage promoting awareness of the value of diverse habitat for pollinators and for the success of working lands, as well as for the benefit of minimal and um, integrated pest management practices that support monarch breeding in agricultural areas. Pesticide drift is such a challenging issue and it has been identified as a major uh, threat and an ongoing pervasive threat to monarch breeding. So California's Central Valley is largely agricultural land and these strategies can uh, guide voluntary actions for interested landowners. Another set of strategies that are really relevant to community and nonprofit involvement are the education and outreach strategies. These are organized a bit differently uh, and they highlight eight different eight identified audiences with actions that accomplish various targets. So those general audiences are the general public, land resource, uh, natural resource land managers, I'm going to just read these from two, uh, agricultural land managers, rights of way managers, landowners adjacent to overwintering sites, state and local political leadership, monarch enth enthusiasts, uh, teachers, and, and finally teachers and non-classroom educators. While these strategies are more agency specific, uh, this fourth strategy, I should say this, while those three strategies right there are more agency specific, these, this fourth strategy is really right on the money for outreach efforts like this webinar today and for audience members like you. One action involves advocating for voluntary efforts by landowners near overwintering sites. Another aims at empowering community members to reach out through their representatives about monarch and pollinator declines. Um, and monarch enthusiast networks are another way to communicate consistent messaging to take action supporting monarchs. And finally, teachers and other educators have a great opportunity to incorporate the Project Wild's Monarch Marathon curriculum into their own teaching materials. While this set of priorities is largely aimed at academic and agency action, a motivated public can contribute to the monitoring efforts outlined in the plan. Um, so there are the, these, these uh, research and monitoring priorities. The research priorities are outlined by, um, by focal uh, habitat. So overwintering life stage priorities, uh, breeding and migratory life stage priorities, and then uh, for monitoring strategies. So you may already be very familiar with these monitoring strategies. So I'll just quickly share the major, the major examples that you might know of. Promoting participation in the Western Monarch and Thanksgiving New Year's counts, uh, which uh, is uh, administered through Xerxes Society and initiatives like the Western Monarch Mystery Challenge and the nationally focused integrative, integrated monarch monitoring program administered through Monarch Joint Venture are great ways to advance the science on the current state of Western monarchs. There are also potential opportunities with butterfly and insect societies, museums and other organizations to run similar long-term studies where an existing monitoring need just hasn't been met yet. And section seven provides some of that necessary language on the voluntary nature of participating in these conservation strategies. At present, like I mentioned, only three of the seven member states can make formal rules regarding native insect species, and that's California, Washington, and Idaho. And management authority doesn't automatically equal dedicated funding for work with Monarch, so implementing these strategies into regular business practices involves some creative solutions like leveraging resources within partnerships. Another goal to you is another goal is to use this plan as a template for developing other cooperative conservation agreements for at-risk insect pollinator species and their habitats. And that kind of highlights the updated name to our working group, 
which is the Western Monarch and Native Pollinator Working Group, because many of these states don't have as much monarch habitat, but they definitely have other at-risk pollinators that, that span multiple, uh, that, that cross boundaries and span ranges in multiple states. But to be very frank, implementing this plan and accomplishing these outlined goals will rely on absolutely everybody to get involved. There is a tremendous capacity of organizations, partnering agencies, and motivating motivated community members out there who can help us achieve increased suitable habitat availability and hopefully a recovering monarch population. Last spring, Wafwood launched the Monarch Chat Reporter. So this uh, CHAT stands for Critical Habitat Assessment Tool, and this reporting form allows you to track your conservation efforts that fulfill strategies in this plan. The form is really simple, and it asks for details like location, who's reporting the effort, and which conservation strategy and action was taken. We really care about the privacy of the folks who voluntarily report these efforts, so the CHAT map does display some of the general information, but nothing that identifies the individual or the specific location of the action. So I will get back to this and I wanna show you how it works, but I wanna go through sort of the, the remainder of the, um, of the, the actual plan itself. So this plan also uh, basically concludes with a commitment to adaptive management, which gives partners and stakeholders the flexibility to revise their conservation member measures according to the best science available and currency pol current policy directions. So there's a lot of in, in, uh, new science um, revealing important insights that need to be captured in re revised versions of the plan. So that means that the working group is committed to also reviewing the plan every five years to make updates to the plan and, and capture progress that we've made towards these stated goals. To, so to um, go back to the chat, uh, monarchchat.org is the the is the the, the URL for this uh, tool, and I'm not sure if I click on this if what I what what pops up is going to also be presented. So I'm going to um, see if this works. Nope. <laughs> Hold on a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop share and I'm gonna share that that screen instead, so I can walk you through how to report. Okay, can you see the Western Monarch chat? I can, that looks good. Did I, can you still see it even though I moved it? Yep. Okay, good. So this is kind of the landing page. This is the dashboard for the Western Monarch chat. And there's two tabs. If you can see there's targeting conservation and there's tracking efforts. And I wanna start with the targeting conservation tab because this is really the original, um, landing page for the Western Monarch Chat, because it, what it has is a habitat suitability model that was developed as part of um, releasing the Western Monarch Conservation Plan. And you can see that highlighted here are all of these uh, um, overwintering sites, potential overwintering sites that have been identified in the model. So the, the general uh, legend here is that if it's blue, the bluer it is, unless it's yellow, the bluer it is, the, the more uh, critical that habitat is for supporting monarchs. The redder that it is, the, the less likely it's, it's gonna be a suitable habitat for monarchs. So it's, it, we follow a similar strategy with the reporting, the tracking side. But the other thing is right here, you can access the full plan. This is the, the link to the PDF for the for the plan and it's you know it's, it's a lengthy document so um i think it's personally very i personally think it's very helpful to have that pdf when i'm trying to find information in the plan because then i can just use the control f you know search feature for uh navigating this document because it's fairly large and if i'm working with the paper version of it i have lots of little tabs um so where you would probably want to pick it up is the tracking efforts and as you can see, many, many of these actions have already been tracked and they all look the same, regardless of what category uh, the, the strategy falls into. Um, and this is kind of a display of the, the, 
the actions that have been reported. As you can see, there's not a lot of um, identifying information here. And just to scroll, just to zoom in on some of the actions that have been taken, that, that zone right there is 49 square miles. So there's no, and, and any action that takes place anywhere in here, um, we'll just highlight that same, uh, that same hex. So there's, there would be no risk of uh, sort of outing yourself if you had some private property that you wanted to report an action on. It's, it's just gonna fall within there and it's not gonna be listed here as like your name or anything. But if we chose that, um, this Xerxes Habitat Kit would have been applied somewhere in that 49 mile, that 49 square miles. So that, that being said, So I'm gonna show you how to track something or how to report something. And the best one I, I think uh, we have an opportunity to report is the Western Monarch Trail, Pismo State Beach, Monarch Grove site sign. Um, so to start, you go to join the effort. And I've already kind of entered this, this information in here just so I was ready for it. But one of the ways that you can uh, select your location is by Entering an address, you can search. Um, you can type something in. This is sort of through Google Maps. Um, you can you can enter uh, coordinates if you want it. You can put in vague coordinates so that they're kind of fuzzy and they don't specifically identify one location. Or if it's statewide or range wide, that, that would be something that maybe um, would be more applicable to a large scale like federal or statewide initiative. So that's also an opportunity you can, um, that if it, it is an opportunity, but I've already selected this. So one of the other things I should mention is that there is a reset button right here. And as soon as you start entering any information into the form, it's all there, it's all saved. So if you advance to the next, through those those little four pages of the of the form, all of the things that you have entered in there are saved, and you can't go back and just click something else because it won't. So you have to reset and start over. But it's not a very long form, so it shouldn't be terribly inconvenient if there was something you needed to change. So I have the location already selected here, and that's Pismo Beach. So it's really highlighting this. Uh, this hex that would be in the ocean. Um, and so there's just a little edge of it right there. And uh, I am reporting this on behalf of Kristen Howland and I have her email address in there and I have the action taken by an NGO, a nonprofit. So the strategy that best fits this is overwintering habitat strategy. And if you recall, you probably don't, it's a, uh, OHS4C, so Overwintering Habitat Strategy number four, um, action number C or action letter C. So I will go to next. So these are the four strategies listed there and each one of those has, um, they, they, they correspond to, this is strategy number one, two, and three, and four. And they're kind of abbreviated here. So it helps to be a little familiar with the strategies listed in the plan before you go to enter anything. So strategy C is educate, educate landowners and neighbors of top 50 priority sites. I don't really know how many landowners were in attendance and that information isn't necessarily uh, required. So you can leave it blank if you don't have a specific number for any of this. And I also am not totally clear on exactly when this, this um, installation was completed or unveiled. Um, so, because I know that it happened in January of 2022, um, I will uh, go ahead and say mid-January, but I can delete this, that's not necessary. What I did upload was a file of the, uh, a, a, was the image file for the, the interpretive sign. And if I wanted to add another one, I could also add a file right here, but I'm not going to. So the final, final page of this form is to give the project a name. And um, so I wrote CCSPA, Western Monarch Trail, in particular, the Pismo Beach, Pismo State Beach Monarch Grove. And now I'm just gonna submit it. 
So my data was sent successfully. I can, re if I want to see where this is, I refresh the page. I'm going to refresh this page. And now if I zoom in on that Pismo Beach, wherever I find it, <laughs> I'm going to go to Grover. Okay, there we go. Now our action is, is identified right there, it's highlighted. So this is you know one of the rare occasions where it would be a little bit more location specific just because most of that hex is hanging out in the sea, but um, it still is non-specific enough that any private property wouldn't be specifically identified. And that is how that works and I am, uh, excited to, I also have a, I, I produce a how-to PDF. Um, there's still some questions and of course we're always improving on this tool, uh, but this is a great way to get uh, a little bit of um, um, kudos uh, for, your, for your efforts and um, have it show up on the map, which is very satisfyingly glowy now um, because of all of the actions that have been taken. California and Arizona are really on fire with, I don't want to say that, okay. They are really doing great. Uh, lot, lots of work out here um, at many, many different scales. So the more we can report, the better we can demonstrate that this is um, an all hands on deck approach to um, helping protect the Western Monarch. and um, and. This is uh, valuable for all kinds of policymakers to see that there is there is a roadmap in place and that it is, it is doing what we set out to have it do. So that being said, I'm going to stop my share again and go back to my last slide, maybe. Maybe I won't, anyway, maybe I'll just leave it. I, the last slide is just my thank you very much for having me present and I would be happy to take questions. That was great, Amanda. I loved it. Loved learning about the um, Western Monarch chat. We're excited about it. It's really promising. Yeah. And, you know, things, of course, but it's it's a really. Um, I think it's very satisfying to see neon yellow glowing on a nice blue map. Yeah. So let's see if we have anything. Let's see, uh, in the chat, it looks like Jerry was under the impression that the sale of tropical milkweed was banned in the entire state of California, but it seems to be that Ventura County currently is the only California county, correct? That's my understanding, and you know, I'm, I'm working out of Utah now, so I really can't speak to a lot of California level policy, but that is the first known, the first publicized implementation of it. Yeah, I don't think it's a state statewide ban. I think I I know I would have heard. Well, I, I think, I it's, I think it's, just, it's guidance um, uh, by the Department of Agriculture. Okay. So and it's recent, so maybe it's still sort of percolating through. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Let's see what else we have here. In the Q&A, we've got, um, someone said, thank you. Also, when reporting, do you need to see a certain minimum number of monarchs to report a site? That is a good question. I think that the, I would not be able to field that question as well as the Xerxes uh, Western Monarch um, Thanksgiving count organizers would be able to, to tell you. Um, I know that if you if you visit the, <laughs> the Western Monarch, um, what's their website? <laughs> <laughs> I, have it, I have it right here. It, I believe it's just Western Monarch Count. Yeah, it's westernmonarchcount.org. And um, I, that, that would be a question that their organizers would be able to specifically answer. You know, if, the, if you have, if you do lay eyes on monarchs um, during a, a certain time frame in late, late November, 
And then again, in um, early January, late December, early January, those are two major points of time that they're um, looking for people to submit numbers. So I think um, they would be the best uh, to, to inform on like whatever threshold they're looking for. Okay. It's hard because I'm speaking on behalf of like a really large partnership and I don't necessarily, you know, I'm not like uh, or organizing any level of that. So um, yeah, I can, I can, I can give you the high level. I can give you, I can point you in directions, but I don't always have those answers. Well, that's okay. That's good. Yeah. We appreciate your direction. <laughs> and I did put the links that you shared in the chat, Amanda. So those are available to everyone. So if you guys scroll through, you can see, um, my computer's being a little silly right now, but you can see the link for the chat reporter. And yeah, I can't scroll. I can no longer scroll through the chat, <laughs> but I put all your links in the chat. So everything is also, if, if you Google Wafwa Western Monarch and Native Pollinator Group, we have all our resources there. And, you know, it's, it's meant to be a hub with these resources. So, um, we try not to make it too complicated because I want to be able to share this information as, as easily as possible with everybody. So um, I know it's a it's a long and technical document. So I was hope I'm just hoping that this gives you a little bit more uh, understanding of how the actions that you guys are already taking um, can can then be captured in this in this larger uh, picture of of collaborative monarch conservation efforts. And I think, you know what, Amanda, I'm looking at several names in on our participant list and I guarantee you a lot of these folks are gonna be reading that document in entirety. Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, get get your tabs, or you know, use that. <laughs> I have all these little neon tabs that I use to <laughs> identify the things that I need to I need to refer back to. It's an excellent reference. Um, but again, you know, we are going to incorporate um, the most up to date science. Um, it is like one of our our midterm objectives for the working group, and yet also, you know, we're looking at a lot of other native pollinator. Uh, oriented tasks that um, that we can use the monarch as kind of an ambassador species to guide like these other actions. Does anyone else have any other? Oh, here's something new. Oh, thank you. They said thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Yeah, you have a lot. That was a you gave a fantastic presentation, and you have a lot of. Um, friends of the monarchs, I'll say, um, yeah. who joined us today. So this is great. That's wonderful. Okay, well, gosh, Amanda, that might do it for us. <laughs> All, right. All right, I was trying to keep it, you know, I really didn't want to get in the weeds for 50 minutes. I felt like that might be too much. It was a lot, <laughs> a lot more to uh, dig into. And, you know, there's hopefully this is being recorded, right? And so then yeah. this is something that you can, you know, people can refer back to if there's just certain areas that really, and I, I think that not everybody's going to need to know every single letter in the, in the document. It, it's probably just best to have, um, these are the areas where my actions generally uh, best fit. You know, I'm, if, 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 if you work the, mostly with developing, um, you know, resources for, uh, landowners and there's there's you know your 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 work fits really neatly into specific categories not the entire document so mm -hmm. you'll get really good at those at, at at reporting on your efforts and please email me abarth at utah.gov if you need any clarification or have any other questions well thank you yeah and this was definitely recorded and once it's uploaded um the link for viewing will be available uh, by visiting centralcoastparks.org slash mind dash walks. And you can see all the recordings for our past lectures as well. So that's a great resource. Um, 
And then most of you are familiar with this, but if you're new to the presentation today, when you close out of the Zoom window, a short little survey window will pop up. And if you would take just a couple minutes to um, read and answer those questions for us, we would greatly appreciate and value your feedback. And Amanda, thank you. I know you're you're super busy. We just really appreciate your time and your knowledge. It's really an honor. I appreciate the opportunity to share. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Love seeing you here on Fridays. And I look forward to the next lecture. Bye, Amanda. Bye. Have a good one.